Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. Today, we are studying in Revelation chapter 10. What did the seven thunders utter? There are those who believe that what the seven thunders utter in this chapter was revealed in 1963. Is this true? Many have speculated for centuries over these things, as our study today gives us a lens on the final <coughs> chapter of God's un folding purposes in human history. If you're not finding our broadcast on social media, sometimes there's a little trouble getting that uh, launched properly, but we'll be making the video available at some point in the day regardless. Revelations chapter 10. Kitty, if you'd begin. I need to need, some, need me to bring that yes. up for you. For some reason, it wanted to stay on okay. chapter nine, and I don't want to. I want to stay on ten. So we use for our Bible. It's one of the ones we use is uh, Blue, Blue Letter, Letter Bible, <coughs> and it's a website, and it's also an app that you can get, and we really like it. I I knew about Blue Letter Bible for five thanks years, and I never used it because I thought. It was too complicated. And then one day I just spent time with it and realized what a really great tool it is. Blueletterbible.com and Blue Letter Bible app in the Android and iPhone market. Yeah, we it's like just it a lot. It's a great tool. Okay. So, Kitty, if you'd begin by reading Revelations okay. chapter 10. Okay. Verse 1, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, and, I, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, several, seven thunders uttered their voices. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices... I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven and, all, and the things that are therein, and the earth and all that in that one moment, and the things that therein are, <laughs> and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be no, there should be time no longer. Go figure. Verse seven. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall s begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go. Take a, the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples the na and nations and tongues and kings. So what did the seven thunders utter? Uh, the followers of William Branham believed that God revealed to William Branham in 1963 what the seven thunders uttered. Now, the interesting thing about that is William Branham never claimed to know what the seven thunders uttered. They just took his followers, took transcripts of 
meetings that he did where they construed uh, that he knew what the seven thunders uttered. But the interesting thing is he never seemed to get around to telling <laughs> that. It's, it's, it's very important to note. William Branham has been libeled. He's been slandered mm -hmm. for decades for things that his followers did and his followers believed. But if you go back and look at what Branham actually said, what he actually did, he repudiated all of the extreme beliefs concerning him and his ministry time and time again. And yet that seems to get uh, left out in all of the criticisms that are leveled against him. But today, in the earlier chapters of Revelation, we're going to see, if we look back, John witnesses the Lamb taking a seven-sealed book from the one that sits on the throne. That's how this portion of Revelation started. Each one of these seals is open, and subsequently the seventh seal in Revelation 8. Now, when Revelation 8 reveals the events associated with the seventh seal, we see the appearance of seven angels holding seven trumpets, and mm -hmm. they begin to sound each in their turn. The first four angels sound in chapter 8, after which there is an announcement that the final three angels to sound will be more dire than the first four. The remaining three angels are referred to as the woe angels or the woe trumpets. Mm -hmm. So in chapter 9, the first and second of the three remaining seven trumpets, the first two of those three of the woe trumpet sounds, revealing events that we discussed yesterday that Martin Luther of the Reformation and Sir Isaac Newton, of all people, understood to be revealed or related to the rise of Islam. The sixth angel sounded in chapter 9, and four angels, which are described as being bound in the river Euphrates, which is modern-day Iraq. These angels, or messengers, or leaders, raise a 200 million strong conventional army, wreaking great devastation on the earth. These four angels, originating in modern-day Iraq, may foretell, foretell a four-nation axis of enmity against the Western world, comprised of Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. Mm -hmm. The things represented in the seven trumpets sounding with the opening of the seventh seal take place, we learned in the latter part, the last few verses of chapter 9, because the Western world, I construe this to respond to the Western world, did not repent of their murders, abortion. How can we claim to be one nation under God when we've killed 50 million unborn babies? Not his plan. How can plan. we be, do anything other than uh, take a posture of national contrition in the light of that? How dare we walk with bluster, bellicose, and belligerence toward our enemies when we're taking the lives of the unborn. Right. Uh, we need to stop and think about this. Th they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries. What are the sorceries? <laughs> the sorceries correspond to clandestine skullduggery in foreign affairs. I think it's absolutely uh, unconscionable that foreign powers such as North Korea and Russia have used social media to uh, sway mm -hmm. the election. They, at least they attempted to do so. It doesn't matter whether uh, the election turned out the way you wanted it to right. or whether your candidate didn't get in. The point being for a foreign power such as Russia, mm -hmm. who is the inheritor of the the leadership mantle of the Soviet Union 
which is absolute anti-God, anti-Christ, atheist regime seeking to manipulate election results, but lest we, we become too indignant in our uh, objection to that, let's think about the United States. Mm -hmm. The United States has made, uh, has made its bones, if you will, on manipulating foreign affairs in nations not belonging to ourselves. And the result has been That's Vietnam. True. The result has been Iraq. The result has been uh, many things that have taken place. The fact of the matter is unrest and chaos and anarchy in the Middle East was brought about by the initiation of a policy a policy sea change after the oil embargo of uh, the 1970s, when this country was uh, paralyzed uh, by the refusal of the OPEC nations to sell oil. They were not right to do that. But the approach that from that point forward that the United States took uh, in terms of international policy and doctrine was to foment unrest and instead of allowing the OPEC nations to come together and create problems for the Western world, <clears throat> we encouraged or at least stood by without intervening as we claim we intervene where there's injustice in the world and we've allowed uh, the Middle East to descend into absolute chaos. That doesn't mean it's our fault, <clears throat> but it does point to to, uh, the fact that our nation has interfered in foreign affairs uh, in much more profound ways than what we're accusing Russia of doing. For example, Ho Chi Minh. During World War II, it was American uh, military specialists that trained Ho Chi Minh and the fighting force that would become the Viet Cong and the NVA, we trained them in guerrilla warfare. And mm -hmm. at that time, Ho Chi Minh, he had, he had worked in a butcher shop in Brooklyn and went to school in New York City as a younger man. And he wanted to go before Congress during World <laughs> War II and make the case for Vietnam as a unified country becoming the 51st state Oh, of the my union. Goodness, you don't hear that. And we promised <laughs> these freedom fighters that mm. were helping us resist the Japanese in Indochina wow. that we would not allow France to bring colonialism, colonial rule back into Indochina. And as soon as World War II was over, that's exactly what we did, resulting in the French occupation of Vietnam, the disaster mm. Bien Van Phu, and what came in the years of struggle in the United States. We need to stop and think about how much we've brought about some of the deepest scars. We've helped contribute to some of the deepest scars upon our country. The same thing was true in Iraq. I remember for over 10 years when the credits would roll with the CNN News Network, they always showed a picture of George Bush Sr shaking hands with a grinning Saddam Hussein because when I was in the military during the Carter administration and the Iran hostage crisis, uh, our Lackland Air Force Base was filled. At one of the biggest uh, military bases in the United States or under our power, absolutely filled with Iranians being trained I'm sorry, Iraqis being trained. Right. And about that time when Iraq was using chemical weapons against the Iranians and 100,000 Iranians died in America, we were applauding because we were powerless to deal with the, the uh, Khomeini who was endorsing the holding of U.S. hostages. Right. And, and so then years later, oh, uh, Saddam Hussein, he's a despot. He's a wild card. Well, we put him in power and we kept him in power by our uh, policies. It goes right back to the law of sowing and reaping. And so mm. where is the contrition? Yeah. Where is the contrition that says perhaps 
we've contributed somewhat. The Bible mm -hmm. says that a fool answers the matter before he hears it. That means there, there are dimensions in every issue of foreign affairs. And I understand it's not comfortable to think about because we're all patriots, we're all nationalists, and we think the United States can do no wrong. But the scripture says these things that are described and these seals being opened and the calamities that come forth, it's not God being some arbitrary despot raining down uh, calamity on the innocent victims upon the earth. It's no, because of their murders, because of their sorceries. Right. What about fornication? Speaking of corrupt government. Thefts. We talked about thefts yesterday. Mm -hmm. Now, what fornications have the Western nations committed? One former terrorist converted to Christianity. I heard him prophesy this, and it really, really uh, struck me. He said that oil is the wine of America's fornication. My goodness. That really sobered me mm -hmm. to hear that. Because I had questioned why, during the Clinton administration, we allowed genocide to happen in the Balkans when NATO stood by oh we can't do anything about that and they brutalized they maimed the soldiers went in and maimed whole people groups brutalized their women cutting parts of their body off mm -hmm. making rape a tool of genocide and we said well there's not a compelling US interest to be involved. But when the oil rich sheiks in Kuwait, right. oh, suddenly our indignation comes into play and we must go and bring righteousness to the Arabian Peninsula. We just have to stop and think. And that is not to denigrate the sacrifice of one American soldier. That's right. Because I was in the military and I have a deep patriotism. But we need to stop and think do our, does our patriotism and our nationalism usurp? or contort with a twisted lens the fidelities of the kingdom and looking at things the way we ought to look at them because it brings reciprocity Absolutely. on any nation. We need to stop and think about Sowing these things, my reaping. brother and sister. That's right. And so in chapter 10, with the sounding of the seventh angel and the seventh trumpet, which is drawing near, this is like a preamble before the seventh uh, trumpet, John sees a mighty angel descending from heaven and he's wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow on his head. Now, what is the significance of the rainbow? The rainbow, according to Genesis 9.13, it's not God reminding us. If you read Genesis 9.13, it's God reminding himself so. that he will not again destroy the earth That's right. by water. Now, mm -hmm. in appearing thus, we understand that there are events about to be revealed in this narrative of Revelation of a magnitude. See, when he's talking about the rainbow, that's a portent. That's dealing with uh, a, an extinction level event, such as what happened in Noah's day. Mm -hmm. It's like God is about to bring some things to pass with a reminder. He would never again destroy the earth by flood. Right. It's a reminder of God's clemency. For all of this, God is a God of clemency Amen. because for all that he is doing that humanity would not uh, find uh, pleasant you have to think about what he's not doing Amen. and what he's refraining Thank from doing God. and so there are events of a magnitude to be revealed so as to encompass all of humanity and affect the fate of the planet in what begins and the angel holds a little book in his hand and proceeds to put his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. Now, Isaiah 57, 20 depicts the sea as the sea of lost humanity. Jesus confirms this metaphor by describing those in, the, in need of salvation as fish that his disciples will fetch from the waters with the net of the gospel. Sweet. Now, if you understand where Jesus preached those messages, when the fish come out of the Sea of Galilee and they go down the Jordan and come out into the Dead Sea, our tour guide in Israel said that when those fish come out of the mouth of the Jordan into the Dead Sea uh, and empty into the Dead Sea, they're dead in a matter of minutes. 
And so it's a complete picture. Why, why were they fishers of men? To save them from the fate that inexorably will happen to them Amen. unless somebody intervenes. Amen. Now the land, one foot on the sea, one foot on the land, the land represents those in the kingdom of God, which in this passage are equally brought under the pronouncements of the angel, one foot on the sea, one foot on the land, the, the pronouncements that the angel so described in verses 1 through 2 is about to make. So the And again, well, aren't we going to be raptured out of here? The only consistent suggestion, and it's really not a suggestion, it's an absolute codified doctrine in dispensationalists who believe in a pre-millennial millennial return of Christ, a parousia of the saints uh, being caught up or caught out of uh, the earth while the earth suffers uh, the judgments of the what is termed the Great Tribulation. They say that when John heard a voice saying, come up higher, that's the rapture of the church in the book of Revelation. I, I don't think the banality of that mm -hmm. viewpoint needs to be emphasized is pretty plain. I, I, I question that. Does that mean there's not going to be a rapture? Does that mean there's not? Are you pre-trib, mid-trib, <laughs> post-trib? Said it the other day, pan. <laughs> fellow. Uh, yeah, I'm pan-millennialist. I think that's the most obscene approach. I said, oh, I just don't want to get involved. Like, it's not important. Well, then I guess we've redacted your canon down to 65 books now, haven't we? And took a few <laughs> chapters out of Thessalonians. Uh, let me tell you something. I am as solidly orthodox within the constraints of the 16 tenets of faith of the Assemblies of God that I came up in as I ever was. The difference was, the difference is this, the things I do with their orthodoxy make them conclude I'm a heretic. <laughs> but I use their same principles of biblical inquiry to come up with what seems to me to be evident uh, expostulations that you're not straining belief to interpret the verses in the way they seem to present themselves. So the angel cries with the mouth of a lion's roar, and his shout is followed by seven peals of thunder with voices discerned in their bellows. John hears these seven thunders, and he proceeds to record their words. But before he can do so, a disembodied voice in the heaven says, commands him, don't write that down. You know, it's amazing. In the, the beginning, Jesus is saying, uh, he, John is seeing all this stuff in the beginning, and John is, falls at his feet and is dead, and he's really having a reason. And Jesus is like, wait, 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 you didn't write that down. Uh, write that down. <laughs> you're going to miss that, and you're going to forget that. You write that down. And now he's like, don't write this down. And I could see John looking up at so, all right now. Do you want me to write it down, or do you not want me to write it down? Jesus is not schizophrenic. <laughs> what did the seven thunders say? Right. That John is forbidden to write. Now, mm. he may have heard things commensurate with what Paul taught when he was caught up in the Spirit in 2 Corinthians 12, 4. said he heard unspeakable words not lawful for a man to utter. Mm. It isn't that a man can't hear these things, but they aren't for general consumption. Mm -hmm. The thought is particularly alien, however, to the man in the street these days who thinks there is nothing that he doesn't have a right to know or a right to hear. In other words, to be excluded? How dare you? Mm -hmm. I've been to better churches than this one. I'm going to go to another church. If I can't hear what the seven thunders uttered, I'm going to go join the Mormon church and adopt the Book of Mormon as my Bible. I'm going to go to the Jehovah Witness church and no. adopt the New World Translation as my Bible. Mm -hmm. Why? How dare they suggest that there's something that I don't have a right to hear? If you want to find out how submitted your church is, Pastor, have a closed-door meeting and don't invite everybody in your church and see what happens. <laughs> Ask me how I know. We are given to know that such things exist that are withheld from us with no promise of ever coming to understand or to hear them, except in the case of one who might find themselves in the position of a John or a Paul today. Mm -hmm. And that's not out of the realm of possibility. Could God have told William Branham? What the seven thunders uttered? Sure he could have. We don't know that he did. And William Branham never flatly stated that. 
but it's certainly possible. And if God ever tells you, if you're going to go to the secret place, Kitty says, you better learn to keep his secrets. Yep. I heard it more than once. The Lord say, let your tongue cleave to the roof of your mouth. He'll tell you things he doesn't want you to utter. So in verse 6, the mighty angel with the little book, it's like a big angel with a little book, <laughs> uh, he declares by this dread oath, he says, time shall be no more. Now, how is it possible that time shall be no more? Time is a finite quality as a function of time bringing into a three-dimensional world the probabilities of the quantum soup from which they believe the Big Bang issued forth the matter that became our universe. Mm. Uh, it's that capacity or that, that quality that Einstein associates with unfolding matter. The absence of time is the definition of eternity. Mm -hmm. The angel is prophesying ahead of time the moment when God creates, and this is very simple. Revelation is about to unfold the most climactic, cataclysmic series of events <laughs> in human history. And all of a sudden, the angel is talking about what happens on the other side of that speed bump. Right. And that is so like God, because I know in my life, many, many times, I have faced insurmountable odds a tsunami of pressure. I don't know if I'm going to make it to my next breath. Oh, God, would you please help me? And then God shows up. Oh, praise God, he's going to help me out. And he wants to chit-chat about five <laughs> years from now when I don't think I'm going to survive the next five minutes. It's, it's just like him. <laughs> it's so God. If he wasn't God, I... I I, we wouldn't be that compatible, but he's God. Because so, the A type personality yes, and God's Lord. Really doing things is How just so different him. from mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, the, and it looks forward to a time. Now, listen, when God creates a, when there's time no more, God creates a new heavens and a new earth, not bound by the constraints Newtonian. of Newtonian mm -hmm. physics or the mysteries inquired into by quantum physicists. Amen. This is to come. But the days of the voice of the seventh angel are yet to unfold immediately in front of John. So in reading this, we think about for a moment, I think time shall be no more. We think about the strict preterist view, which believes all this came to pass already. We wonder how a person could learn <laughs> these things and conclude, oh yeah, all that came to pass back in between Jesus and the Emperor Constantine. That's all came to pass in the first three centuries. Mm -hmm. You're just not spiritual enough to see it. Let me ask you a question. In what we've studied thus far, from the preterist standpoint, I want to ask the preterist, when did a 200 million man army rise up and decimate a third of the population of the earth? When did that? I want to know when that happened, if it's all come to pass. It did not. <laughs> when was heaven and earth brought to a place of time suspended, as mentioned in this chapter. When did time shall be no more between Jesus and Constantine? When did that happen? These are events that portend an apocalyptic tableau of cosmic upheaval mm -hmm. that we find it difficult to imagine. Yet preterists, uh, with the preterist perspective that it's all already come to pass, they dismiss these things with a wave of their hand, concluding if you don't see things, their way, you're just religious-minded and non-spiritual. <laughs> Let me say something to you, brothers. Peter prophesied, brothers and sisters, Peter prophesied that these influences, such as this, would creep into the church in the last days, which I want to quote Peter's prophecy about this in its entirety. Right. Second Peter 3, verse 3 through verse 14. Knowing this, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking at, isn't that so typical of how people, when they want to argue about the book of Revelation and eschatology, they scoff. Absolutely. Oh, ah, you're just not spiritual. You're just not a member of the Deeper Life Club. You're just not with it because yeah. you don't agree with me. There are scoffers walking after their own lust. What is their lust? To be right. To yep. know more than everybody else. And it's pride. And they're saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willing to be ignorant of 
that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Mm -hmm. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as mm -hmm. some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away. Remember the bow? I'm not going to do it by water. But the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. When you understand the relationship between time and matter, time, matter, and space, according to Einstein, are all made up of the same thing. When time is no more, matter and space as we know it vanishes away to become something else altogether. Mm. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be <laughs> in all holy behavior and godliness? Looking for, here's our attitude, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, Amen. wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, Amen. wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, that you may be found in him in peace, without spot, and blameless. So. Amen. Those who roll their eyes at the idea of the coming of Christ and the unfolding ap apocalyptic eventualities associated with that, they are resoundingly rebuked by the very apostle that Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to. Tell Peter you're a pan-millennialist and see how, what he says to you. <laughs> we must not endure these glib skeptics who read such things and dismiss them as though these scriptures do not carry the weight of canonicity. What is to be our posture then? We have no right or permission to adopt dogmatic insistence regarding what we read mm -hmm. of the prophets and unfolding eschatology. We are instead to take these things to heart look to the future as being in God's hands and resolve above all things in the certainty of his advent to be found in peace, just relax, mm -hmm. without spot, that deals with walking in love, Amen. and blameless. And then verse 8, at this point, the prophet is commanded by the voice in heaven to take the little book in the angel's hand and eat it with the warning. Can you imagine? <laughs> Eat this book. Angel shows up, hands you a phone book. Eat it. Hey. Okay. It tasted like I, honey. I love you, Jesus. <laughs> with the warning that it would make his belly bitter, mm -hmm. but would nonetheless taste sweet to his mouth. So we see then in the early chapters, the lamb takes a book from the one on the throne, and now the prophet takes a book likewise. As he is in the heavens, so are we so on the earth. We. If he's taken a book in the heavens, mm -hmm. we're taking a book on the earth. The lamb opens the book he receives, but the prophet eats the book that he is given. Now, why would it be sweet to his mouth and then bitter? Psalm 38 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Whatever originates in God is a rejoicing to the believer. Amen. But sometimes it's bitter to his belly. Why? When you eat something, it goes into the stomach to be processed. That means there is process and outcome in God. Amen. The book promises an outcome that's sweet to our souls, but the process is bitter. There is everybody wants outcome, nobody wants process. How many, but how many want ice cream? How many want outcome? Oh, me, me, me. Can I have an extra scoop? 
uh, how many wants process, how many want to eat their peas, <laughs> their liver and onions. Oh, no, oh, 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 not oh, that. Oh, 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 I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> no, thank you. I'll just have my ice cream. How about that? So we're sustained, yes, in sweetness and grace. But of the dread proportions for the inhabitants of the earth, we participate. There's process. This is not God uh, up in the heavens like the Wizard of Oz behind the partition, pulling levers and pushing mm. buttons with steam and smoke coming out of this uh, heavenly apparatus while Dorothy and... Uh, the tin man and the lion uh, are look on with wide-eyed uh, fanciful amazement. No, we're a part, just like the prayers of the saints. At every point up to this point in Revelation, the prayers of the saints predicate what happens in the heavens. Mm -hmm. The kingdom doesn't come with observation. We have to be engaged mm -hmm. until the final unfolding of God's plan for humanity were we to be alive at this point in history. <laughs> Powerful teaching. I don't know about you, but it helps me to study these things. Amen. I'm not interested in speculation. I'm not interested in how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. No, sir. I want to eat the book and mm -hmm. I want to engage in God's process. Yes, we do. Both his cosmic process, his in the macrocosm, and his process in the microcosm as the God whose character is revealed in these things on the cosmic level right. is working by um, identifiable patterns in my life, your life on a daily basis. Mm. Would you pray? Yes, help us, Father, to achieve your goal, that you would see your seed and be satisfied, that we'd be part of that company of people, the sons and the daughters that you paid such a precious price when you sent the darling of heaven to earth that we could believe. So we thank you, Father, for courage. We thank you for strength to believe your word and your spirit um, rather than what we hear on the news networks and what we hear in gossip and rumor mills, Father. We choose you. We choose your word and you have already chosen us. So help us in our resolve to walk in holiness before the Lord because those uh, that have a pure heart will see God. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you big. <laughs>